In book one of this trilogy about Fernando's amazing life and turbulent times, we explored his enchanted childhood in Barcelona and Montserrat, his meteoric rise to celebrity as a young man in Madrid, and his patriotic response to Napoleon's disastrous invasion of Iberia. Now, in book two, we'll reveal Fernando's astounding trajectory in exile from joy, grief, and adversity in Paris, to instant acclaim in London, to redemption in Paris, and to universal celebrity on his triumphant grand tour of Europe. Fernando and Joaquina joined thousands upon thousands of Spanish refugees who crossed the border into France, seeking refuge from the tyranny of King Ferdinand VII, and praying for a day when a united Spain would embrace the values of the Enlightenment. It might have demoralized them to know that the tragedy of Spain's civil war would repeat itself many times, even into the 20th century, when a similar river of Spanish refugees would flood into France to escape the dictatorship of Francisco Franco. Following Napoleon's debacles in Spain and Russia, his Grand Armée was shattered and his marshals refused to fight on. In April 1814, the Senate deposed Napoleon and he was imprisoned on the island of Elba. Paris surrendered peacefully to the victorious armies of Emperor Alexander of Russia and King Frederick Wilhelm III of Prussia, who marched through the city to throngs of cheering Parisians, who had not known peace for 25 years since the Revolution of 1789. Fernando and Joaquina watched the procession, and so he caught his first glimpse of the Russian emperor, with whom he was fated to develop a special bond. The great powers of Europe restored Bourbon King Louis XVIII to the French throne, and they celebrated his coronation with festivities including operas, ballets, and concerts. A gala concert was held in the Théâtre de Spectacle in the Tuileries Palace. It was organized by Luigi Cherubini, a celebrated Italian composer based in Paris. Beethoven considered him his most important contemporary, and Rossini adored his operas. Cherubini, in turn, was a fan of Fernando and put him center stage at the gala concert. Here is the finale of Fernando's Gran Sonata, Opus 22, a rondo in C major, performed here by Ricardo Gallen in Russia. <laughs>
Fernando's Paris debut was a resounding success with everyone except King Louis XVIII and his Bourbon court, who, in spite of Fernando's genius, did not yet take the guitar seriously. In contrast, Emperor Tsar Alexander was so impressed that he immediately had invited Fernando to compose and perform for the imperial court in Russia. Fernando wanted to accept, but politely deferred the invitation, and for a very good reason. Joaquina was expecting a baby in January 1815. She was in no condition to travel clear across the continent, and of course Fernando would not leave her alone in Paris. Tsar Alexander smiled and said he looked forward to welcoming yet another sore prodigy to Russia in the foreseeable future. The two men liked each other, and they instantly bonded. Fernando would indeed take up the Tsar's invitation, although not under circumstances he could have then foreseen. Another pair of influential ears at Fernando's Paris debut belonged to none other than Muzio Clementi, an Italian-born composer, virtuoso pianist, conductor, editor, and piano manufacturer based in London. Clementi was enthralled by Fernando's performance and promised to feature him on London's most distinguished stages should he ever choose to visit, or even better, relocate there. This invitation would shortly become momentous for Fernando. On January 14th, 1815, Fernando received the greatest gift of his life, but at the same time was also struck the cruelest blow. Joaquina gave birth to a beautiful, healthy daughter, Carolina, but tragically died herself of childbirth complications. Moreover, owing to the indifference of the French Bourbon court, Fernando found no steady means to support himself and his infant daughter. But historic events soon charted a much more magnificent course for Fernando. In March 1815, Napoleon escaped from captivity on Elba and raised a new army. Louis XVIII fled Paris, which was thrown into political uncertainty and turmoil. So Fernando took up Clementi's invitation in April and sailed to England with Carolina. Within days of his arrival, Clementi arranged for Fernando's inaugural performance at the Elegant Argyle Rooms, London's most fashionable venue for concerts, masquerade balls, and other entertainments. First, Fernando played a fantasy. Here is an excerpt 
featuring an improvised dance by former prima ballerina Kasumi Sanada. Thank you. 
Fernando was also developing something new for solo guitar, at least for him, namely themes with variations. Here's an excerpt from the English song Marlboro Goes to War, whose melody is lately better known as The Bear Went Over the Mountain, as well as For He's a Jolly Good Fellow. It is performed here by Japanese virtuosa Kanahi Yamashita. Thank you. 
Fernando's London debut at the Argyle Rooms brought the house down. Among the distinguished gathering that gave him a standing ovation was none other than Prince Augustus Frederick, the Duke of Sussex, and younger brother of Prince Regent George IV. But an even more momentous event involving Prince Augustus unfolded backstage after the concert, in the private Blue Room, where the performers socialized with the leading nobles and foremost patrons of the venue and its entertainments. Prince Augustus was regaling Fernando with his latest travels in Italy, and hummed a few measures of a popular Italian ariette composed by Girolamo Crescentini. Recall that Fernando knew Crescentini well from his years in Madrid. He asked the prince if he would like to hear the ariette sung in the manner of the composer himself, whereupon Fernando did a perfect imitation of Crescentini's style. While everyone in the Blue Room had been astonished by Fernando's virtuoso guitar solos, they were now enchanted by his versatile voice. A journalist for the Society Pages wrote in his column that, if Soar's guitar playing proclaims him a great composer, his manner of imitating Crescentini proclaims him a grand master of song. Within weeks of this scintillating debut at the Argyle Rooms, Fernando was invited to give a command performance for the royal family themselves in the fabulous circular room at Carlton House, the Prince Regent's London Palace. Princess Charlotte was so entranced by Fernando's playing that she became his avid guitar student, thus enhancing his reputation, inspiring his composition of yet more studies for guitar, and furthering the development of his method. Its first edition would circulate privately in London to Princess Charlotte and her peers. Demand for Fernando as a teacher of both guitar and voice soared in London, pun intended. Before long, he was joyfully reunited with his dear brother Carlos, who, owing to the relentless persecutions of tyrannical King Ferdinand VII, had joined the rising tide of exiled liberals. The brothers opened the Soar Academy of Spanish Guitar in their West End London home, and it immediately flourished. Fernando soon discovered that not only the Duke of Sussex, but also English music lovers in general, were simply mad about Italian ariettes and so he began to compose and perform them, accompanying London's greatest sopranos and mezzo-sopranos on guitar or piano. Fernando's Italian ariettes became so popular that a leading music critic wrote, Mr. Soar's vocal compositions have gained such favor among the higher order of musical dilettanti that a new set of ariettes from his pen causes almost as much sensation as the publication of a new novel by the author of Waverley. How extraordinary that Fernando's ariettes drew comparisons to the best-selling novels of the legendary Scottish bard and author Sir Walter Scott. Here is one of many Italian ariettes that Fernando composed during his London years, sung exquisitely by the late, great Montserrat Figueras.
But during May and June of 1815, there was a darker and more disturbing reason why London's royalty, nobility, and high society found Fernando's music so enchanting. A clue was afforded by the gilded quotation from Horace, engraved on a Carrara marble scroll that hung above the main stage in the Argyle rooms, to drink a sweet oblivion of the cares of life. These days, their overarching care in life had a name, Napoleon. He had previously defeated six coalitions of the great powers, and was now on the march to challenge a seventh. Wellington stood in his path at Waterloo, anxiously awaiting the arrival of England's Prussian ally, Field Marshal Gebhard von Blücher. Napoleon did not wait. He prepared to attack Wellington, hoping to defeat the English forces, then the Prussians, and then to regroup before the Austrians and the Russians could arrive. Londoners held their collective breaths, for if the Corsican dragon defeated the British lion, their home island itself would be vulnerable to French invasion. Music was their main escape from anxiety, and in the two weeks leading up to the confrontation between Napoleon and Wellington, Fernando was invited to give no fewer than eight concerts, playing solo pieces and accompanying London's leading female sopranos, such as Angela Catalini and Henrietta Sala. When Napoleon finally met his downfall at Waterloo on June 18, 1815, British relief and jubilation knew no bounds. Now Napoleon and Fernando were both most wanted men, but in very different senses. Napoleon became a hunted criminal, Fernando a favored composer and revered performer. Napoleon surrendered himself to the British, who held him captivity for life on the remote island of St. Helena. Regency London, meanwhile, surrendered itself to Fernando, who captivated them on every stage and salon in London's elegant West End. Inspired to new heights by the favor accorded him, Fernando wrote romantic fantasies, themes with variations, English minuets, French society pieces, Italian ariettes, Polish mazurkas, Spanish songs, Viennese waltzes, military marches, divertissements, Sicilianas, serenades, elegies, and adieux. Here's an extract from one of his mazurkas for piano, a society piece typically played in salons.
Another instrument in circulation at the time was the harp guitar, or harp lyre. Fernando's lost compositions for this instrument were unearthed and recorded by John Doan. Here is a sample of one of his so-called little progressive pieces. Although Fernando's life overflowed with composition, performance, and teaching, he was devoted to his younger brother Carlos and, of course, to his beloved daughter Carolina. The Soares also kept company with an ever-swelling tide of liberal refugees from Ferdinand VII, Spain. Thousands of Spanish émigrés settled in Somerstown, an area around St. Pancras, which Londoners soon called Little Madrid. Fernando's friends and acquaintances from this community included liberal generals Francisco Esposi Mina and Miguel Ricardo y Alava y Esquive. He dedicated 60 divertimentos to Manuel Palacio Fajardo, an active agent of Simon Bolivar. He gave guitar lessons to José de San Martín, who went on to become the liberator of Chile. There were also bankers, financiers, and publishers like Vicente Bertrand de Lis and literati like José María Blanco y Crespo, who assumed the rather improbable, if amusing English pen name, Blanco White. Fernando loved commiserating with his expatriate community, and they loved his exuberant energy and infectious joy. Yet their company often made him feel homesick for Spain. Anyone who attains Fernando's orbit of celebrity and adulation knows full well that whenever Fortuna lavishes such extravagant favors, she also exacts a steep personal price. So beneath his perennially cheerful countenance, Fernando privately harbored his share of sadness at the ongoing devastation of his homeland and grief at the irreversible death of his wife, Joaquina. Perhaps that is why he was so moved when he first heard the sublimely beautiful and profoundly heart-rending Scottish lament, Ye banks and braes of bonny doon. The melody was written by Neil Gow in 1788 and paired with a Robbie Burns poem in 1792. Here is a moving performance by Christy Lynn, a veritable songbird, replete with Scottish tartan and Celtic harp. <laughs> Chanty 
Perhaps haunted by the verse Departed Never to Return, Fernando wrote an introduction, theme, and variations on the air, here played beautifully by Alice Arts. Notice how Fernando imitates not only the genre, but also the harp itself. <laughs> Thank you. 
Indeed, as Fernando learned from his expatriate friends, by 1819 even Francisco de Goya had departed Madrid, unable to bear any longer the despotic machinations of King Ferdinand VII. The newly empowered Spanish Inquisition was hankering to burn some of Goya's paintings, if not the artist himself, and the king demoted him from first court painter to a lesser position. So at age 72, Goya moved into a small house on the outskirts of Madrid, sank into deep despair, and produced his now famous black paintings. This one, called Fight with Cudgels, depicts two Spaniards beating each other senseless while sinking ever deeper into a quagmire under an angry sky. But the most horrifying of the black paintings is surely Saturn devouring his son, Goya's depiction of the state devouring its own citizens, who are its children. Today the painting is on display in Madrid's Prado Museum. During this period, a second and even larger wave of Spanish refugees fled King Ferdinand's sadistic persecutions, and the population of London's summer's town doubled. Notwithstanding his astounding success and popularity in so many genres, Fernando still wanted to write another opera. But in those days, there was relatively little demand for opera in England. Undeterred, Fernando contented himself by writing three arrangements for voice and guitar of arias from Mozart's Don Giovanni. Here is one of them, sung beautifully by Neria Baraondo. <laughs> Increasingly inspired by his life in London, in 1821 Fernando wrote what has become his signature piece for solo guitar, Variations on a Theme by Mozart. He dedicated it to his beloved brother Carlos. The composition is a benchmark for all aspiring virtuosi. Here is Segovia's scintillating rendition from his iconic Paris film of 1954.
Beyond this, Fernando still desired to compose works for several, if not many, performers, so he wrote a series of concertante pieces for what amounted to a string quartet with the guitar replacing the first violin. He also wrote symphonies for the entire orchestra. Here are a few measures of his first symphony in C major. Then came another breakthrough, one that would catapult him to unimagined heights. The English were simply mad about ballet, and so Fernando resolved to compose some. He began to frequent the King's Theatre, at that time the epicenter of London's thriving ballet culture. And this is how he first laid eyes on Felicité Houlin, a young, talented, and ambitious Parisian ballerina whose older siblings, brother Jacques and sister Virginie, were dancing successfully in Paris. Fernando and Felicité immediately found each other mutually inspiring, and the first two short works he wrote for her, Divertissement Ballets, were well-received and commercially successful. This swiftly led to commissions by foremost patrons of London's ballet scene to write two full-length ballets, which Fernando composed in rapid succession. Fortunately, when the leading Parisian choreographer of the day, François Albert de Combe, known simply as Albert, heard Fernando's piano reductions, he gladly agreed to choreograph them. Having by now committed considerable sums of money, the investors felt confident, if not ebullient. Perhaps to bolster his spirits and to fill the sudden vacancy in his wallet, John Ebers, manager of the King's Theatre, wrote in his diary, How could a ballet fail? the work of such an artist as Albert, and the music by the extraordinary Spaniard Sor, who is known to be the most perfect guitarist in the world. Indeed, Fernando's ballets would soon succeed beyond anyone's wildest expectations. Here is an excerpt from the first of them, Alphonse et Léonore, ou l'amant peintre, alluding to the romance between King Alfonso of Castilia and his mistress Lenore, and possibly with a nod to Goya, and his mistress Leocadia.
but it was the second of Fernando's ballets, aptly titled saint Rion or Cinderella, that would prove life-changing for everyone associated with it. Following its premiere at the King's Theatre in March 1822, saint attained the stratosphere of critical and popular acclaim. The entire first season sold out within a week. Albert then took it to Paris, where it would meet with even greater success. When news of saint reached Tsar Alexander of Russia, he invited Felicité to become prima ballerina of the Bolshoi, and Fernando to become composer of the imperial court. Felicité and Fernando were married in Paris in 1823 and embarked on a grand tour of European performances en route to Russia. Their entourage included Felicité's brother Jacques, who had agreed to dance with her as primo ballerino of the Bolshoi, and Fernando's daughter Carolina, a child prodigy singer herself and now eight years old, a perfect age to embark on her first European adventure, Carlos Sor returned to London to maintain the Sor Academy and to look after his now famous brother's music publishing interests. First they toured Reims, Brussels, Cologne and Bonn. En route to Leipzig, they detoured from Weimar to Marienbad to visit the legendary Johann Wolfgang von Goethe, the greatest polymath and humanist of the era. Freedom of speech and artistic expression had been suppressed throughout the German Confederation by the Carlsbad Decrees of 1819, and Goethe showed Fernando an underground political cartoon that satirized this tyranny. This group is called the Thinkers' Club. The sign on the wall behind the table says, Important question to be considered in today's meeting. How long will we be allowed to think? The sign on the right lists the rules of the club. 1. The president opens the meeting at precisely 8 a.m. 2. The first rule of a learned society is silence. 3. So that no member, having made full use of his tongue, will end up in prison, muzzles will be distributed upon entry. Von Goethe became, in effect, Fernando's political mentor, helping him to make sense of the struggles for social and political reform that were convulsing Europe from end to end. Von Goethe may have been the wisest man alive, but as a poet, he was also an incurable fool for love. That summer of 1823, at age 72, he became hopelessly infatuated with then 19-year-old Baroness Ulrike von Letzewau, whose rejection of his marriage proposals spurred him to write his now famous Marienbad elegy. From Marienbad, the company continued to Leipzig, where Fernando played the organ on which Bach had composed as Kapellmeister of St. Thomas Church. The company was treated to a concert by the famed Tom Anarchor, the choir school founded in 1226. No doubt this recalled nostalgic memories to Fernando of his halcyon years at Montserrat. Here is today's Tom Anarchor, performing a Christmas oratorio by Bach, accompanied by Leipzig's famed Gewandhaus Orchestra, the first orchestra to be founded and supported by the bourgeoisie alone, without any royal or noble patronage. <laughs> Thank you. 
In Berlin, Fernando and company were received with utmost grace and favor by King Frederick Wilhelm III. They gave acclaimed public performances at the Berlin Opera House and a private one at the king's opulent Sans Souci Palace. The king remarked that he had never seen so much talent arrive in Berlin in one single coach. He wrote excitedly to his daughter Princess Charlotte in St. Petersburg. She was now Princess Alexandra Feodorovna, wife of Tsar Alexandra's younger brother, Prince Nicholas I. In his letter to her, King Frederick Wilhelm sang the praises of Fernando and his fellow artists. Fernando's ballet Cendrillon was like a glass slipper for the whole company, if not a magic carpet ride, transporting them on their triumphant grand tour of Europe and toward their glorious sojourn in Russia. Here is part of the overture. At Sans Souci, they were met by a Russian coach flying the pennant of Emperor Alexander and escorted by Russian cavalry. They traveled to Warsaw, where they were honored guests of Prince Joseph Zazajek, Viceroy of Poland and a great Polish patriot. They gave extra performances in Warsaw by popular demand and were themselves astounded by a youthful prodigy named Frederick Chopin. Prince Zazajek explained to Fernando how Russia and Prussia had wiped Poland from the map of Europe, and Fernando was overwhelmed by the tragic contrast with Spain. The Poles were a united people without a sovereign nation, while Spain was a sovereign nation without a united people. The company departed Warsaw in late October of 1823 so as to arrive in Moscow ahead of the Russian winter. And here ends book two of the trilogy. <laughs>